Welcome to the investiture of the 30th leader of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Chancellor Jennifer L. Mnookin. Please turn your attention to the video monitors. I think UW-Madison changes the world in so many ways. UW-Madison is special because it embraces everyone. It belongs to all of us. What makes UW-Madison special to me is that it's an environment where people really want to nurture each other and bring out the best. I think University of Wisconsin-Madison impacts the world primarily in two regards. One is its incredible breadth of world-class research, coupled with this enormous, passionate, and uh, viciously proud set of Badger alumni who are also located globally. The University of Wisconsin-Madison is committed to the highest quality of classroom teaching, research, and public engagement. And I think that the university is really uh, leading the charge in how we want to see uh, our community grow, our community be healthy, our community be uh, successful. Now, the breadth of uh, connections that this university has, both in research industry relations, alumni, isn't surprising at all, but it is truly inspiring. Just learning about what is happening in these walls, it's amazing. People who have been here, who've researched here, who've been students here, who've been alumni here, they have gone out and done these incredible things, and I think they've changed the world not only on this big global scale, but also interpersonally in their communities, in relationships that they've had, in corporations, in community groups. Um, the people from UW-Madison are really, I think, special. There's a huge ripple effect to what happens at Madison. We produce Peace Corps volunteers. We produce CEOs of businesses. There's almost no university you could visit around the world where UW-Madison would not be prominent among their tenured faculties. I think we have to start with the Wisconsin idea. The very sincerely held commitment to being part of our community in our state, serving our community in our state, learning from our community in our state. I think that's what really sets UW-Madison apart. All that we do has to be done for the common good. And so it's doing that, not just for the citizens of the state, but also for the country and for those outside of her borders that we can't even see. I think we've always taken seriously our commitment to diversity and equity and justice and I see those being our North Star for the future as well. But to me it does feel like there's this kind of giddy energy always when you get a new leader that anything is possible, that we can make changes, we can do new things and that opens up this kind of limitless possibility of what we can do as a campus. She was so excited about the opportunity from the beginning. She is uh, a, a big believer in the, in the mission of public education. I have always admired Jennifer's breadth of intellectual curiosity, her keen analytical mind, and her deep passion and commitment to public higher education. I think I'd start with collaborative and inclusive. She's someone who has uh, incredibly high IQ and incredibly high EQ. And I've always known her to be courageous and ambitious for the institution where she is a leader. It really stood out that she is a big thinker, uh, creative human being, um, and very compassionate in her thoughtfulness. She's also really strategic. She's a great strategic thinker. She is extremely high energy, as anyone who has ever met her or spend time with her knows she's indefatigable <laughs> and she gets energized by the job. I have witnessed her connecting uh, successfully with everyone here from my fellow deans to our students to our faculty to people in the community and we are as a public university dedicated to serving everyone in our state that's what the wisconsin idea is about in those early engagements in madison and then out in the state i think you saw the chancellor right away embracing the diversity of wisconsin and also embracing the wisconsin idea and recognizing that lifting that and sharing that is important. 
not just to the citizens of the state of Wisconsin, but to the country, to the world. It's really important to listen and learn at the beginning. And I think there are lots of reasons for that, to, to really move an institution forward. You have to understand it, and you have to understand the characteristics and the aspirations of the people who are there. So Jennifer Style is inherently consultative. Uh, she listens to what others have to say, oftentimes pressure tests uh, the recommendations she hears, and, but she chooses the best solutions without any ego involvement. I really feel like she brings a spirit of collaboration and that she'll build something together with us. One of the things that really stands out to me is that she asks questions about who we are, what we're passionate about, what we're doing right now to pursue our dreams. And the fact that she asks questions and clearly can retain them uh, shows how invested she is in each of us. I was really excited that from the beginning, she came with an open mind to listen to what we were doing with the Public History Project. She came to learn. And that really, I think, speaks to her leadership skills. I think it speaks to the she's willing to take risks, she's willing to do something bold and new, and she's willing to kind of stand by it. This chancellor is committed to doing what's right for Native people, and you know, everyone who surrounds her is committed to doing what's right for Native people. She's a, a boots on the ground type of chancellor, and uh, she's seen by our student athletes, and I think they appreciate the fact that, that she's there and, and that she shows her support for them. Well, Jennifer came into a good situation. Becky Blank handed this off uh, in great shape. And I think Jennifer's ability to build relationships with key stakeholders is going to serve us well and might open up some possibilities that we haven't had up to this point. The work that the previous chancellor uh, was able to um, create uh, now is uh, enhanced by the work that I see that Chancellor Manukin is, is really uh, pushing us to do not coming in and thinking that you need to remake the place entirely, um, being curious about, attentive to what's working well at the university, and then calling on us to push forward, right? Calling on us to keep pushing to be better and better. I think as a lawyer, she's trained um, to listen, to read, to digest, to evaluate before she reaches a decision. It is a job that requires you to identify after listening to a lot of people, um, what you think is the best direction, and then being able to explain why um, you believe that's the best direction. And I don't think Jennifer will have any trouble with any part of that. I think Chancellor Manukin has a special capacity because of her training and the work that she's done leading a law school and as a legal scholar, to really appreciate where people are coming from especially where they have different points of view. And I think that is a, a really important asset to have in a leader. These jobs have nonstop challenges that require thoughtful and steady leadership. She has these qualities and, and UW-Madison is lucky to have her at its helm. Right. We are training the next generation of leaders. And I think Chancellor Manukin sincerely understands that. Um, and she's gonna continue to seek out ways that this university can educate that next generation. Her perspective, her uh, energy, her uh, ability to relate and communicate with others, um, her creativity and, and uh, her leadership will, will result in moving this university forward in a great way. Everybody is rallying behind her and is willing to do everything they need to to support her and her leadership and we will work together to be successful with this great university for another hundred years or thousand years. I think she's going to be terrific. Like I said, these jobs are not easy um, and it takes a special person to succeed, but Jennifer is that special person. She's just the greatest person I can imagine to lead the University of Wisconsin. I am on a campus that is changing for the better. I think we have a very bright future ahead of us. I think the future of UW-Madison is incredibly bright. So bright we have to wear shades. <laughs>
standing as you are able for the singing of our national anthem performed by Jersey Gillen master of music candidate class of 2023 oh say can you see by the dawn's early light 
what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave Good morning, and welcome to all who have come near and far to join us at the investiture ceremony for Jennifer L. Manukin. Please join me in thanking the student performances this morning, the Park Street Quartet and Jersey Gillen. My name is Jay Rothman, and I have the privilege of serving as president of the University of Wisconsin system. I am proud to have begun my tenure with the UW just before Chancellor Mnookin arrived to assume her new position in Madison. This is a new chapter in the UW-Madison story, and I am delighted that there are so many faculty members, staff, students, campus colleagues, community leader, leaders, regents, legislators, Chancellor Mnookin's family and friends, as well as a number of university friends here, whether in person or, by, or participating by live stream, to be part of this great event and this great celebration. The investiture of our new leaders is one of the oldest traditions in academia. Though well, by its nature, it is a time to look to the future it's also an opportunity to honor those who came before us. UW-Madison has become a world-class and globally recognized university that is likely far greater than anyone could have imagined when it was founded back in 1848, the same year Wisconsin became a state. UW-Madison is now preparing to celebrate that rich history and bright promise as it marks its 175th anniversary starting this summer. In the spirit of the iconic Wisconsin idea, this university is responding to the most complex and urgent challenges facing Wisconsin and the world, sharing its knowledge and expertise beyond the borders of the campus that impacts lives every single day. It is educating growing numbers of students who will become sought after engineers, healthcare workers, educators, data scientists, and yes, critical thinkers, thought leaders, and so many more who will help shape our future. And it is doing it at a time when the pace of change is accelerating and the challenges facing higher education are complex. Jennifer Manukin is the right leader at the right time. She brings an incredible intellect and has served as a faculty member and leader at some of the nation's preeminent public universities. Central to her vision, she brings a principled approach and an unwavering, an unwavering commitment to working collaboratively to build a future where UW-Madison our flagship institution in the system is not just good, 
not just great, but is exceptional. And that is the way it should be. Quite simply, Jennifer Manukin is made for this university. Today, we officially celebrate the beginning of the Manukin era with congratulations, good cheer, and high hopes. And to get us started, it is only appropriate that we acknowledge that the land that UW-Madison ha inhabits is the ancestral home of the Ho-Chunk Nation, one of the 12 First Nations of Wisconsin. Today, our stage includes the flags of the United States, the state of Wisconsin, and the flag of the Ho-Chunk Nation. These flags are also currently flying at Bascom Hall. This is an important step in UW-Madison's our Shared Future Initiative, which is an ongoing effort to educate the campus and the broader community on the Ho-Chunk Nation and the history it shares with this university. These flags are a symbol of our commitment to work toward the well-being of citizens of the state, the nation, and the world. We invited our first speaker to offer remarks on behalf of the indigenous communities that have called this land home since time immemorial. It is my pleasure to introduce Pri uh, Professor Brian McGinnis, who will offer a welcome that acknowledges and honors Wisconsin's First Nations. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Brian McGinnis. Ha-ho, bojo, sagoli, pozo, greetings. My name is Brian McGinnis, and I'm a member of the Ojibwe and Potawatomi Nations and serve as a member of the faculty here at UW-Madison. We've assembled here today in Dejob, a place in which people have gathered since time immemorial in support of learning, community building, the rituals of life and death, and the installation of new leadership. For such events, indigenous nations have always sought out locations referred to as the high ground, those metaphoric, physical, and even spiritual places that offer a kind of long-range vision that allow us to see beyond the challenges of day-to-day -day life. There were many ways the First Nations of this place recognized leadership. Whether it was destined, dreamed, or raised up by the people, leadership was always earned and leadership was always from the heart. Amongst the Haudenosaunee, it was the clan mothers who selected and raised up the leaders of the Six Nations. For the Ojibwe, Lenape, and many other tribes here in Wisconsin, sanctioned groups of elders would come together and make sure that the leadership of the future, that the decisions of the nation were made by the wisest and the most careful. New leaders were walked around the great lodges turned to each of the four sacred directions and given recognition across the length of the nation. After a long winter, indeed, we now find ourselves in a moment of revitalized perspective and action. In this great place, this high ground, we once again have the opportunity to honor such long-standing traditions of leadership. And for a moment, asking each of you to look around and recognizing for an instant that this is already a great community of leaders, standing here together as we are, and standing here in support of our commitment to Dejob, to our community, and to the full recognition of our leader, Chancellor Jennifer Manukin. Penagigi, Miigwech, Niawan, Weiwenin, thank you. Even before becoming Wisconsin's governor, three-time Badger Tony Evers had dedicated his life to education. Prior to his election as the 46th governor of the state of Wisconsin, he spent his career in Wisconsin's K-12 schools and the education system, first as a science teacher, then as a principal, and later he spent a decade as the state superintendent of public instruction. With over three decades of public education experience, 
Governor Evers has ded dedicated his life to fighting for Wisconsin's kids and serving the people of the state of Wisconsin. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Tony Evers, Governor of the State of Wisconsin. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, President Rothman, and good morning, everyone. It is an honor to be here today to celebrate this time-honored tradition, the investiture of UW-Madison's Chancellor and the UW's newest leader, Chancellor, Chancellor Jennifer Mnookin. Before I get started, I'd like to take a moment to recognize the leadership and service of former Chan uh, Chancellor Rebecca Blank, who, as a steadfast advocate for higher education, played a huge part in the progress we are here to celebrate today. In the wake of Becky's passing earlier this year, we continue to keep her family and loved ones in our thoughts and thank her for the great work she did for this university and for our state. <laughs> Chancellor Manukin, you enter this role with critically important work before us. You've taken on this responsibility with excitement and determination, bringing with you key ideas and goals for maintaining our flagship institution's momentum in the years ahead. Over these last several months, it has been great getting to know you, working alongside of you, and learning more about your vision for one of our state's most cherished institutions, a vision that I believe we both share. As governor, I have been especially grateful for your eager interest and appreciation for our Wisconsin traditions and way of life. And that's in no small part because I believe, as I'm sure you would agree, is our state's heritage and traditions, the Wisconsin idea among them, that helped make this university special. It is our state's heritage and traditions that have and will inspire generations of students to want to stay and build their futures here in Wisconsin. And that has included yours truly, by the way. <laughs> They're also what uh, brilliant award-winning and world-renowned educators to want to uproot their lives and perhaps their families just for the opportunity to teach on this campus. They're what helps harness our homegrown talent, our ingenuity, and ensures we continue to heed the call of our forebears to move as always ever forward. It's because of our heritage and our traditions that, as I'm sure you found, set UW-Madison and our University of Wisconsin system apart from campuses across this country. This university is so much more than just a school. Its impact, whether as a top employer or as a national leader of groundbreaking research, stretches far beyond the campus, as it should, because in this, one of our country's greatest laboratories of democracy, the innovation we manifest here envelops the envelopes we push here, the ideas we pursue here must transcend these buildings and this campus. Our job here is not to just educate, it is to inspire the next leaders, the next big ideas, the next policy solution that will help people make other lives better and make sure that our government works and works well. And yes, that includes, or at least it should, informing the decisions that are made in that big white marble building right down State Street <laughs> from Bascom Hill. That's why today I'm excited for your partnership in the, in the responsibility we now share to continue to invest in the success of this university, students, educators, and our education system. You've already begun laying the groundwork for your legacy here at UW-Madison, and I am hopeful that we will have many more years to work, to get, work together toward our shared goals for this university and for the state of Wisconsin. So thank you for taking on this important role, and I look forward to our work ahead together. Congratulations, Anne on Wisconsin. Thank you.
We are fortunate today to be joined by four former chancellors of UW-Madison, three in person and one via video message. Chancellor Manukin invited each of them to share a memory from their time on campus, as well as a hope for the future. Donald Shalala served as Chancellor of UW-Madison from 1988 to 1993 and was the first woman to serve in that role. We are glad to welcome her back to Madison. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Shalala. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, a chancellor with the right color hair. <laughs> Governor, Mr. President, Madam Chancellor, um, I want to acknowledge uh, the former chancellors, Ward, Wiley, and Martin, and add my sorrow with the passing of Becky Blank. I will note, though, that my best friend I haven't seen yet, my best friend here was Bucky Badger. <laughs> he was the only person that never talked back to me. Madam Chancellor, there are three memories that I will share, not about football. <laughs> My first memory was trudging up Bascom Hill in a furious winter storm. A student jogged past me, <laughs> and he turned around and said, don't worry, worry Chancellor, it gets easier. <laughs> and it did, even in the lean years. What makes a world-class university? Sifting and winnowing by which alone the truth can be found. And something simpler, the commitment of the faculty to the next generation of students and faculty. I'll never forget during one of our skinny 1% raises, a number of department chairs came to me and said, the full professors would forego their 1% and give it to the assistant professors. That's what makes a world-class university. My final memory is when the freshmen arrived, many from rural and small towns in Wisconsin. I would give their worried parents my home phone number. And very early one Sunday morning, my phone rang. It was the mother of a freshman. She was clearly very distraught. Her son had not been in touch for two weeks. I said, have you called him? She said she was very hesitant. She didn't want to embarrass him. <laughs> I reassured her, took his number, and called. <laughs> A very sleepy young man answered, Charlie, call your mother. <laughs> Who is this? The chancellor. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I tell this last story, Jennifer, to give you a piece of advice. If you're going to be successful here in Wisconsin, remember the taxpayers of Wisconsin will continue to invest with great pride in this world-class university only if you put their children first on Wisconsin. Well, when you're calling parents or calling children, that is a full service chancellor, I think is the way one would describe that. David Ward served as chancellor of UW Madison from 1993 to 2001, and again as interim in 2011 to 2013. David just returned to town this week to enjoy our beautiful Madison summer. I think, David, you came at the right time because I don't know if you looked at the forecast yet for the weekend, but I'm not sure summer is quite here. But uh, that is as it shall be. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ward. Yeah, in California, it's wet. Uh, I, I think uh, I want to say uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, welcome to all the distinguished members behind me here. Um, 
I know that Jennifer is extremely well qualified, wonderfully qualified to be a chancellor, but she doesn't know the real reason. If you look at the list of chancellors that are being celebrated here, Shalala, Ward, Wiley, Martin, and tragically, uh, formerly, Becky Blank, the one thing you know that she shares with them is we're all short. <laughs> It is now almost 30 years since I began my first chancellorship. And of course, uh, like today, I'm following my close and dear friend, Donna Shalala. Uh, so it was a great challenge. You don't know quite what you're going to have to say because you don't know what she's going to say. <laughs> but memories do become opaque and certainly imagined. But the early 90s, when John, Donna, and I were here, uh, I think it was uh, memorable because it was an era that in retrospect was more of a reform era in higher education than we often believe. It was the first time that we really attempted to confront the uh, limitations of the grand experiment in mass higher education in America that really uh, infused the 1960s. But that, the energy had run out of that reform movement and we were involved in trying to address it. Among two very big issues that came up, and there were many others, was the quality of undergraduate education. It's the students stupid, they really matter. But the other one was really knowledge itself and how to attack knowledge and the discovery of knowledge and whether our curricular structure was designed for that. Our learning curriculum was very narrow based on disciplines and subdisciplines, but our research was unbounded and there was a misfit. And one of the ways we attempted to address that here at the, in, during that period was to think about how we made appointments. Appointments are the gold realm of, uh, of a university, and we decided maybe we should appoint people in clusters, not just individually, and those clusters should transcend departments. And perhaps in quartets or quintets, we could have four or five people, each from a different but related department. When this was suggested, a whole variety of people said we're neither institutionally prepared or fiscally capable of entering in such an experiment. And besides, why will departments give up the autonomy of their precious appointments? Well, in, occasionally you do tend to in, ignore you know, general sentiment, and we thought, well, let's have a pilot project. And the pilot project, I was told cynically by many people, would attract maybe four or five applicants. The first call for applications was over 100. 100 clusters of different transdisciplinary uh, faculty. And so this thing then proceeded. And I thought, well, that's an interesting legacy. Little did I know that I would return 10 or so years later as interim chancellor. As interim chancellor, I met with students, and uh, one of the most interesting parts of that was the students asked me, what was my title? I said, Chancellor Emeritus. She said, they said, they brought you in and demoted you? Interim. <laughs> And so I said, well, what do you want to do about it? And the students said, well, we'll think about it. And they came back with the idea of Chancellor Encore. It's my favorite title. <laughs> I was also met by a faculty member who thanked me profusely and said he was part of one of these clusters and thought that uh, it was very, very an important thing. And it sort of bounded me. And I think all of the chancellors that, that have um, been part of this sequence have really made that commitment that the structure of knowledge is something that can be very, very obsolete in its divisions, and we really need to figure our way and discover our way through it. How to give advice to the future? Um, I'm not sure in retirement, one of the great challenges is you can be a prophet. And whenever I try to be a prophet and say to people, we could do this, usually there's somebody in the room who said, well, why didn't you do that when you had the job? <laughs> so I'm very reluctant now to uh, actually give uh, too much advice. But there is one issue going on as we try to think and look forward to continued innovation in higher education in a new world of uh, instructional technology, of social media, of brand new areas of knowledge, uh, a merger and acquisitions movement that's going on between different disciplines. There is one area that really is obscuring that, and that is the whole issue of open dialogue and free speech, and exactly how one confronts that, particularly since it is often driven by unbounded social media and has very little to do with the curricular structure. 
And the response is often uh, on the part of those who are concerned about free speech, or some of them, is that we need to control the curriculum. The curriculum is not where the heat is. The heat is in the social media, which precedes usually the speech, which is controversial. How we handle that, I never, I think, as Chancellor faced it, but how we actually try to answer that, and I'm sure we have a Chancellor who really can work that tightrope. But I think the fact that the issue of open discourse, important though it is, can frequently become so toxic that the really important innovative issues of higher education get lost. I wish Jennifer great luck because I'm sure no chancellor will be able to escape the problem of what do we really mean by open discourse. Thank you. John Wiley served as chancellor at UW-Madison from 2001 to 2008, but his tenure at this great university goes far beyond those years. At UW-Madison, he's also done impactful work as a professor, department chair, dean, and provost. Quite a list of impressive titles. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wiley. Well, David said he was challenged by having to follow Donna. Imagine my challenge following both of them. <laughs> so I was asked to uh, think back to my time as chancellor and highlight what was most meaningful to me and lasted best as a result of having served as a chancellor of UW-Madison. And I had a lot to choose from. Uh, the buildings on campus, including this one, that I was uh, involved in either launching or building or uh, inaugurating or renovating, tearing down, whatever. The buildings take a lot of a chancellor's time. But this one has a lot of unique features that I won't even try to go into. It's the most unusual building on campus and in many ways one of the best. One of the newest, too. Uh, going through that, going through all of the cluster hires that David mentioned, the period of time when we were doing that, I had a difficult time coming up with one single incident or thing that has lasted with me, except time management. It turns out that I had to spend a minimum of a third of my time away from Madison with the Alumni Association around the world, with the UW Foundation, talking to potential donors, raising fund money for the university. Uh, a third. Another third was spent dealing with our external relations between the university and the business community of Madison, our leadership in the State House, the governor, the legislature, and so on. And the other third was probably was spent being chancellor, sitting in my office, uh, thinking about the university and what it needs and what issues we have to deal with. That was a, only a third of my time. As far as the future is concerned, um, I have every confidence that the university is under great leadership under Jennifer Mnookin. I have every confidence that it will continue to be one of the best universities in the world. There are two issues that I think you're going to have to face that none of us did in quite the same way when we were chancellors. One is the increasing encroachment of external forces trying to help us manage the university, even on the academic level, all the way down to academic freedom for the faculty and the issues of tenure for faculty. That's number one. Number two, we've put a lot of time and effort and thought into managing the term student athlete. And we've always come down on the side of treating them as students first, athletes second. That was before the days when the concept of image and likeness became a very valuable uh, revenue source for the student athletes. That means the athletic part of the student athletes. I think we're going to have challenges in the future in that area as well, dealing with how our coaches can, and our athletic director can recruit the athletes they want in an environment where it's easier to buy an athlete. 
Um, I think that's something that you're going to have to deal with, Jennifer. And good luck to you. <laughs> Diddy Martin served as chancellor from 2008 to 2011 and is currently a president in residence at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. While Biddy was unable to be with us today in person, she recorded this video message from Massachusetts. I would now ask you to please direct your attention to the video screen. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad to be here, even if from afar and only virtually. Jennifer, congratulations and thank you for inviting me to celebrate with you. I wish I were there. You also asked that we speak about a most or the most memorable experience we had at Wisconsin. And that's of course impossible, but I'm trying to comply. What stays with me perhaps above all is the distinctive combination there of intellectual vitality and the beauty of the place. This combination of intellectual vitality and the land and the structures came together for me perhaps most pointedly when I took part in one of Bill Cronin's, the Distinguished Historian's Wisconsin Idea Tours through the state of Wisconsin on which the combination of intellectual life and its history in Wisconsin and the history of the land were the focal point. I will never forget it. You also asked about our hopes for you. I hope that you will take as much pleasure and find as much joy in the students as I did when I was there as chancellor. I hope you will be as inspired by the work of the faculty across disciplines and professional studies as I was and still am. I hope you will get the support you need to move things forward in the ways you've already begun articulating. That you'll be able to use the Wisconsin idea and the long history at the University of Wisconsin of commitment to academic freedom to do the work that needs to be done everywhere in education. Congratulations. Jennifer, you've now heard from four of your predecessors and I heard kind of a common theme coming through that. It's that you have some really interesting challenges ahead of you and good luck. So. Um, <laughs> We would be remiss today if we didn't take advantage of our location, the beautiful Hamill Music Center and the Mead Witter School of Music. To, and, and, and I would now like to welcome to the stage two talented musicians, Alan Foyt on bass and Isaiah Dobbins on piano.
If you need an example of how the arts enrich the soul, that was it. Please join me in giving uh, another round of applause to Alex and Isaiah. <laughs> On behalf of the faculty of the university, we are joined today by University Committee Chair and Associate Dean of Research and Professor in the School of Human Ecology, Lauren Papp. As the chair of the university committee, Lauren represents the interests of the faculty through UW-Madison's system of shared governance. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Papp. A word on investiture, a word familiar to some, but not all in the audience. As one of the oldest traditions in higher education, originating from English universities and modeled after knighthood ceremonies, an investiture is an opportunity for a university to officially recognize its new leader. In academic circles, this term has come to mean a leader who will represent the university's insignia and regalia. While UW-Madison does not date back to medieval times, we are celebrating our 175th anniversary this year. Our central tenants, sifting and winnowing, the Wisconsin idea and shared governance greatly inform the university's teaching, research, and public service missions. A few words on shared governance. UW-Madison has a long-standing practice of individuals working collaboratively for the good of the university. But widely distributed decision-making makes the job of our chancellor uniquely difficult, too. Let's face it, it's quicker and easier to get things done at an institution that is top-down. Yet, without question, our approach has resulted in a history of excellence at UW-Madison. In Chancellor Mnookin, we have a leader well suited to this environment and one whom I have found to be fully inclusive, collaborative, and curious. True to her legal scholarship and teaching, she is so skilled at asking questions that help us to see around corners. In short, her leadership style models the fundamental ideals of shared governance. I have been impressed by the depth and breadth of Chancellor Mnookin's knowledge of the university's strengths and her clear commitment to identifying opportunities where we can do even more to deliver impactful teaching, research, and public service. In closing, I return to the word investiture and its meaning in higher education. What exactly does it mean to represent the university's insignia and regalia? Today, it means working hand in hand with faculty, staff, and students to preserve, protect, and grow UW-Madison's extraordinary legacy. In Chancellor Mnookin, we have a thoughtful, visionary leader who will guide the university to new heights inspired by the excellence of her predecessors and the dedicated work of so many in the campus community. I am grateful for the time I've had to work with Chancellor Mnookin, for her leadership, as well as for her commitment to shared governance. I am very enthusiastic about the future of this great university. Thank you. And now on behalf of the students, we are joined by Associated Students Madison Chair, Endemazia Fonkamp. Endemazia is a junior majoring in urban planning and has, has been involved in multiple student groups. As Chair of Associated Students of Madison, Endemazia represents the interests of students through shared governance. Please join me in welcoming Endemazia.
I think it's time for me to admit the hat's not working. My head's too big. <laughs> Hello. Um, for the last 12 months, I've had the honor of serving as the chair of the Associated Students of Madison. And throughout my tenure as chair, I've had to grapple with leadership in an environment as unique as the University of Wisconsin. In my and Chancellor Mnookin's time, leadership has followed pretty much the same arc. Get to campus, try your best, figure out all the things people are asking you for, regain your composure, and lead. <laughs> The mission of the University of Wisconsin-Madison is to provide a learning environment in which faculty, staff, and students can discover, examine critically, preserve, and transmit the knowledge, wisdom, and values that will help ensure the survival of this and future generations and improve the quality of life for all. It's the mission of every student to find a place where they belong. It is both incredibly easy and incredibly difficult to complete this project on a college campus. So easy and so difficult that it seems world ending. However, the spirit of rebuilding, resilience, sustainability, and community, of creating worlds better for the next generation and the one that follows, is a value I see ingrained in the origins of this university system and in the spirit of our university's new leadership. I look forward to the ways that generations of students will benefit from a dedication to student shared governance and leadership that considers all student voices at the table. Chancellor Mnookin and I have met several times since her arrival on campus, and each time I've been impressed by her ability to listen. It is one thing to nod along when students talk and smile and agree and ask them what their major is, but it's another thing <laughs> altogether to really look a person in the eyes and listen, not to respond, but to understand. Chancellor Mnookin has always listened directly to students, and this, to me, marks her as a true leader. By nature, a student is only a student for a select number of semesters. Their experience in those years shaped the way they look back on their time. Was it fruitful? Was it full of fun with friends and moments of growing up? Was it tormented by chemistry exams and biology labs? Was it happy? Was I happy? In the arena of representation, students are intimately capable of self-governance. And it also takes a village in order to support students to the best of their ability. Strong visions in shaping the culture of a university are necessary for student success, as necessary as intelligent and dedicated faculty, knowledgeable and devoted staff, and clean and plentiful dorm rooms. <laughs> a vision for a university defined by and in service of its students is what we have seen from Chancellor Mnookin. And as student leaders grow and leave their roles, as we graduate to new paths, two things will stay constant. That students will always fight for a just and better world, and that visionary leadership will always be needed to defend hard-fought wins. Congratulations, Chancellor Mnookin, and to the university and its acquisition of an ardent defender. Thank you. Gives you a lot of faith in the future, doesn't it? I'm now pleased to introduce writer and educator Aurora Shamshak. Aurora will receive her Master of Fine Arts degree this spring and plans to pursue her doctoral degree at UW as well. She will read an original poem entitled The Apple-Shaped Earth and We Upon It after June Jordan and Walt Whitman. the apple-shaped earth, and we upon it. On Library Mall, new boots and leaky sneakers puddle hop. In dorms and apartments, 10,000 feet slip into socks, while at campus daycare, a four-year-old blows kisses from the top of the slide. Outside, the buses release their air. I call into this space the bus driver, her thoughts tending home, tending love, as she waits for the light to change and the last ankle to land safely 
on the sidewalk. Is there a poem in this? Here, those up before dawn, the snowplowers and public radio hosts, the new parent, the second shift nurse, the cook pouring custard for fudge bottom pie, the security guard who washes his father's hair. In March, a man rides his bicycle to play piccolo in a snowsuit. Another in their wheelchair swerves to avoid ice. Here, the choreographer, thinking in movements of bodies. Is there a poem in this? I call into the space those who think in layers of rock, in eons, and in rice crops, in movements of feminist film, and in the movements of a musical score. I want them all here, the climate scientist and the violence disruptor, the prayer rememberer and the prairie restorer, the bird mapper, the greenhouse waterer, the curator of Japanese prints. I call into the space the rural sociologist, the cows and their keepers, the combine drivers and the counselors, the question askers, and those just learning to question. I call into the space the muralist in overalls and nose ring painting on State Street, those who said their names, those who demanded we say their names, those who shout and those who sing, those who document, those at the meetings, those who bring first aid kits, the engineer with bandaged wrists, the actor with fentanyl in their blood, the man not far from here, incarcerated, who would like, when he gets free, to keep these. You, all of you, are necessary in this space. I call us all here and say, may someone be there to catch you, even you, who have always done the catching. We all need to be ushered and fed. Not far from here, the mound builder's bird and water spirit. Not far from here, the burial mound leveled to build Bascom Hall. Here, a class will learn Menominee, learn Quechua. Here, a student proofreads their parents' English. Here, a playwright asks, what dream would you give your mother? And someone is inventing a compost program. Someone is pulling carrots. Someone is teaching how to plant a pea trellis. The Arboretum's Korean maple, Forsythia planted in corridors to yolk split in spring. Their fibers take in the sound of us, our belt line, our TV show opinions, coyotes howling after sirens. What has the earth taken in? This place has a story. What poem will we make? It is now my pleasure and honor to introduce our keynote speaker for today's investiture, President of Northwestern University, Michael Schill. President Schill recruited Jennifer and her husband Joshua to join the UCLA faculty in 2005. And we saw, when he saw her administrative talents, he convinced her to become his vice dean. And the journey began. 
Now they are counterparts at two of the most influential universities in this nation. Please join me in welcoming President Michael Schill. Thank you. Well, I am thrilled to be here today to celebrate the inauguration of Jennifer Mnookin as University of Wisconsin's 30th leader. I would like to commend the search committee and the regents on their excellent and their discerning judgment. You could not have made a better choice in finding someone to lead this university to an even greater future. Today, the importance of higher education, the importance to our world's future, both in educating the next generation and in discovering new technologies, cures for disease, and insights into the age-old questions, it couldn't be greater. At the same time, at the same time, the challenges we face are more difficult than they have been perhaps since the 1960s. Now, I've been a faculty member for 36 years, 11 of them as a law school dean at two universities and eight as a president at another two. And I can't remember a time when we were under the microscope so intensely so many of our nation's problems are playing out on our campuses today. Now, as Chancellor Mnookin will address in her own comments, one of the biggest challenges we face is the growing lack of trust in higher education. Public opinion surveys consistently find a large drop in confidence in colleges and universities in recent years. Now, the good news is that among our nation's leading research universities, like the University of Wisconsin, about three quarters of Americans still have favorable views. But even among our greatest universities, more people that we are, think that we are going in the wrong direction than in the right direction. Those of us who care about higher education, which no doubt includes everybody here up on the stage and in the audience, we should be concerned about these results. What's behind them? Well, certainly, the polarization of our politics is a factor. Support for higher education is much greater among folks who lean left than lean right. But criticism is abundant on both sides of the aisle. Four out of five Americans are concerned that we are too expensive. Indeed, a recent NORC study that was released a couple weeks ago indicated a majority believe that a college education is not worth the cost. Imagine that. A majority think that what we do which is really give opportunity and create knowledge is not worth the cost. Some critics think that we are places of privilege that actually perpetuate inequality rather than generate a more equitable world. And also a significant proportion of Americans believe that we're ideologically unbalanced and, they, and that we push an agenda that they don't agree with and that is hostile to people of their views. Regardless of whether these concerns are borne out by fact, regardless of where you come down on them, those of us who care about higher education would be myopic to ignore them. A growing number of states are considering legislation that would undermine the very foundation of our universities freedom of expression, and academic freedom. The core element that has made American universities the best in the world is that we trust our faculties to determine what they teach and how they teach it. 
legislative efforts to constrain what we do, either in the classroom or in our research, they're antithetical to the fearless pursuit of knowledge and transmission of that knowledge to the next generation, something that I view as sacred. Now, despite our differences, fortunately, Americans are also unified in the belief that research that takes place at universities like Wisconsin is essential to human progress. Big majorities trust us and rely on us to find cures for diseases and solutions to some of the thorniest and most consequential technological problems facing our society. And you know, I am astounded by the great work your faculty are doing here. In just the last year, faculty and students at the University of Wisconsin have won MacArthur Fellowships, Guggenheim Fellowships. They've established a federally funded Rural Partnership Institute, and they have grown retina cells in the lab that may be the key to curing macular degeneration. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. So the stakes are high. With all of the challenges and opportunities we face today, leadership matters. And I cannot imagine any university having a better leader than Jennifer Manukin. And, and I'm not just saying that because I love Jennifer, which I do, and that I view her as one of my closest friends and confidants, which I do. I say it, I'm an empiricist. I say it because it's true. <laughs> I met Jennifer Manukin 25 years ago when she was on the teaching market, and we were both a bit younger. She doesn't remember me from that time, which I guess I've I can deal with, but boy, I remember her. Her job talk was an amazing excursion through science, virtual worlds, and the law. Now let's fast forward to 2005. I was the new dean at the UCLA School of Law. I heard from my predecessor that we had the opportunity to bring Jennifer and Joshua to LA, and I better not blow it. <laughs> After a month or two of negotiation, and let me tell you, you never want to be on the other side of the bargaining table from Jennifer, she came. I'm not sure I made much of a difference in the recruitment. I think that the academic excellence of UCLA, and perhaps equally, the culinary excellence of Los Angeles real restaurant uh, scene did all of the heavy lifting. Now, Jennifer Manukin is the very essence of an intellectual leader. Her PhD in the history and social study of science and technology from MIT gives her a deep understanding of the value of the humanities, the social sciences, as well as the sciences. That's a unique combination. And unlike most graduates of Yale Law School, including myself, she actually knows something about the law, and she's a darn good lawyer. <laughs> Jennifer is the sort of academic that I envy. When I go to a colloquium, I struggle most of the time, and most of the time unsuccessfully, to come up with a question that's going to impress all of my colleagues with my erudition, with my intellect, with my insight. For Jennifer, it's second nature. It's effortless. At UCLA, at the colloquia at UCLA, she always asked the best, most incisive question that would take your, and importantly, the presenter's breath away. She didn't do it to show off, but she did it because she loves 
engaging with ideas. Indeed, Jennifer is relentlessly curious and inquisitive just about everything. Just ask a waiter who has taken her order at a restaurant. <laughs> you go on for five or 10 minutes. Uh, the, in addition, in addition to being a world-class scholar, Jennifer Manukin is also a born academic administrator. No matter how hard she tried, and sometimes she tried, Jennifer could not stop herself from getting involved in the running of the law school when I was dean and thereafter. Of course, as dean, I had every incentive to encourage that behavior. Jennifer quickly became a trusted member of our elected advisory committee, a key part of our shared governance, and then my vice dean. I couldn't have asked for a better partner, and the law school flourished. Now, after I left for the University of Chicago, Jennifer did yet another tour of duty as vice dean, and then became dean herself in 2015. She transformed the law school, beginning new programs in areas ranging from law and technology to immigration law. Jennifer was deeply committed to making the institution more inclusive. And while at UCLA, she raised the average academic credentials of the students while simultaneously increasing the school's racial diversity. And I know at Wisconsin, she is already involved in increasing financial aid for Wisconsin residents and examining how Wisconsin can further improve its research, teaching, and service missions. Now, while dean at UCLA, Jennifer raised buckets of money to support students and academic programs. Jennifer is engaging, empathetic, intelligent, and fun to spend time with. All key elements in getting donors excited about an institution and excited about its priorities. And I remember the day, I remember quite well, she called me to gently tell me that her annual fundraising had eclipsed my record. <laughs> now, that didn't surprise me, and indeed I was delighted, both for her and most importantly, for the school. Now I believe that what makes a great academic leader is someone who can bring together people, faculty, students, alumni, staff, and legislators. These disparate groups of people might not always, and usually don't, start in the same place. But when a leader can bring them into a shared mission, the results can be extraordinary. Jennifer is that type of person. She listens, she synthesizes the view of her community, all the while guided by an amazingly strong moral and academic compass. And there isn't anyone who can pull off wearing red better than Jennifer Manukin. <laughs> now, I have a very small group of wonderful friends and confidants, some, of in the, some are in the audience today, who I turn to for advice and support. Jennifer is a very important part of my support network. We talk on the phone at least once a week, sometimes while walking our dogs. I wouldn't make an important decision without bouncing it off of her. Whether it's about my own career, my academic and strategic priorities for our school, or which couch I should order for the president's house. <laughs> we share our triumphs, we share our challenges. You all are so fortunate that Jennifer Manukin is your chancellor. She is the perfect person to lead you through a period that requires 
the very best in a leader. Thank you. It's a very special moment for me now to introduce UW System President or UW System Region President uh, Karen Walsh. Karen served as the chair of the hiring committees for both my search as well as the search for Jennifer. So Karen, I wanted to thank you for a tremendous amount of work uh, in getting those searches done because it is a tremendous amount of work. And as one of my friends told me, he said that uh, with the subsequent hiring of Jennifer, apparently your batting average has gone up to 500. I don't know exactly what that meant, but it, it is what it is. Karen's leadership as president of the Board of Regents is just one of the many contributions she has made to this university as well as to the entire state of Wisconsin. So please join me in welcoming Regent President Karen Walsh. Thank you. Such a proud, happy day in the life of this institution. Chancellor Jennifer L. Mnookin, by the authority vested in me by the Board of Regents and the University of Wisconsin system with the support of faculty, staff, students, alumni, and friends of this great university, and before your family and the distinguished company gathered here today, it is my honor and privilege to install you as the 30th Chancellor of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. As mentioned, <laughs> as mentioned earlier by Professor and University Committee Chair Lauren Papp, today we recognize the leader who will embody the university's insignia and regalia. The university's official seal and motto since 1854 is Numen Lumen. The Latin phrase means God is the light, or as UW's first chancellor, John Lathrop, wrote, the divine within the universe, however manifested, is my light. The medallion with the university insignia will now be placed on your shoulders as a symbol of the role and commitment that you have as its 30th leader. The medallion will henceforth be worn at every commencement and convocation. Chancellor, I invite you to join me for the ceremonial medallion placement. And now, at this time, it is my honor and privilege to welcome to the podium Chancellor Jennifer L. Manukin. Regent President Walsh, rocking those red shoes, <laughs> members of the Board of Regents, President Rothman, my fellow chancellors and presidents, members of the faculty, staff, and students, including shared governance leaders, distinguished guests and delegates, family, friends, and colleagues. Let me start with a story. On a hot July day in 1964, a young researcher named Tom Brock, who would soon become a UW-Madison professor, took a road trip out west. He decided to stop at Yellowstone National Park, a place he'd never been. 
Now, most of us entering Yellowstone might marvel at Old Faithful, or the mountains, or the magnificent waterfalls, or the extraordinary wildlife. Not Tom Brock. As a microbiologist, he was gobsmacked by the pink, yellow, and blue-green slime that spread across the runoff from the hot springs. He asked around, what was it? People shrugged. No one seemed to know much about it. But his curiosity was piqued, and he returned to Yellowstone to do fieldwork and to learn more. And he pulled from those hot springs a strain of bacteria no one had ever seen, which changed our understanding of the conditions in which life is possible. He named it Thermus aquaticus. It offered tantalizing clues about the possibility for the condition of life on other planets, but its immediate impact was here on Earth. This bacterium could reprodu reproduce itself in the hot springs at very high heat, and its heat-resistant enzyme turned out to be just the thing for powering a molecular copy machine that can amplify a few strands of DNA into amounts large enough to measure. The impact of Brock's discovery is dazzling. It paved the way for the invention of polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, a wildly important technique that has transformed scientific fields from biotechnology to forensics. This process requires repeated cycles of extreme heat and an enzyme tough enough to survive those cycles. In my own area of, of scholarship, expert in scientific evidence, the rise of PCR testing turned DNA testing into a wildly useful investigatory technique, both for identifying wrongdoers and bringing wrongful convictions to light. And in 2020, Thermus Aquaticus helped drive a major breakthrough that everyone in this room has benefited from, the PCR test for COVID-19. Now, when an interviewer asked Tom about his monumental discovery, he said simply, I was just trying to find out what kind of weird critters were living in that boiling water. That strikes me as a very Wisconsin thing to say. <laughs> Then, as now, the University of Wisconsin-Madison is simultaneously exceptional and modest, driven not by a need for glory, but by a dedication to excellence that's rooted in and grows from a trio of core commitments to curiosity, to collaboration, and to service. Now, as I look around this beautiful symphony hall, I'm a little overwhelmed. I see so many people who have nourished this excellence over many years. And I see so many people who have welcomed me warmly over this last eight months, alongside people from whom I have learned so very much over many years. I am tremendously grateful and completely humbled to have this opportunity to lead this incredible university in this beautiful place, once called De Jope, as you heard Professor McInnes say. Thank you all for your trust in me. I am also acutely aware that I stand on the shoulders of so very, very many others who have led this university to great heights, even if they weren't all of great height themselves. <laughs> Many thanks to my predecessor chancellors who made UW-Madison stronger. We and I have benefited from your leadership and wisdom. I also want to recognize and thank my immediate predecessor, the extraordinary Rebecca Blank, who did so much for this university and was enormously generous with me during my first six months here, even as her own health was failing. 
Let us please take a moment and share a round of applause for the leadership of all our former chancellors, including those are, who are with us today, Donna Shalala, Chancellors Donna Shalala, David Ward, John Wiley, Biddy Martin via video, and also Becky Blank. I thank Regent President Karen Walsh and the Board of Regents for your leadership and for trusting me with this extraordinary opportunity. Thank you to President Jay Rothman for your confidence in me and your tremendous partnership in what is, for both of us, a first year in a new role. To the other presidents and chancellors in the room, both from my sister UW institutions and from elsewhere, the chance to work with you and learn from you is a gift I treasure. To Governor Evers, thank you for prioritizing higher education and recognizing its critical importance to our state. <laughs> to the many community leaders and elected officials in the room, Thank you for understanding the fundamental importance of UW-Madison to our great state and for the warm welcome, the advice, and sometimes the constructive criticism, encouraging us to do more and be better. Thank you as well to the faculty and staff who make this expansive, broad-ranging campus extraordinary and who have helped me over the past eight months to better understand the precious parts of our DNA that must be preserved, as well as the places where we have opportunities to do something differently and better. I especially want to thank my Chief of Staff, Jennifer Noyes, who began working with me about a month before I officially started, and who has worked indefatigably and with great wisdom ever since and Provost Carl Schultz for his work with me this year and his many years of service to this university. <laughs> Carl, I'm going to be cheering you on as you go from being a badger to a duck, but don't, don't give away all your red. You know, keep a little bit of red mixed in with the green. Uh, thank you also for the to the vice chancellors, deans, and other leaders of this university for combining a commitment to excellence with a deep service ethos. A special thank you to the small but mighty team who put together the events of Investiture Week, most especially Carrie Olson and Deb Curry, as well as everyone who worked with them, and huge appreciation more generally to the dedicated and talented staff of UW-Madison. Your efforts, persistence, and commitment fuel our mission. Let's give you a round of applause. I'm also grateful for so many of our alumni and friends who are not just loyal, they're fiercely loyal to this institution and their generosity gives us a margin of excellence. And a particular thank you to our students, nearly 50,000 undergraduates and graduate students, many of whom are the first generation in their family to go to college and who come to us from every county in Wisconsin, every state in the United States, more than 120 countries around the world, and who inspire me with their passion, their curiosity, their caring for one another and for this university. I'm also so deeply appreciative of the many family, friends, and colleagues who are in the room today, a great many of whom have traveled from so far away to be here with us. To my UCLA colleagues, from deans to faculty, to administrative leaders and alums who came to Madison today, even though it's the very busiest time of the academic year, it means the world to me that you made the journey. Welcome to the Big Ten and game on. <laughs> Thank you.
to so many others who've traveled to be here, from a dear high school friend, to my college roommates, to intellectual mentors, to law school classmates, to law faculty and deans from elsewhere, thank you not only for being here today, but for being there in so many ways for so many years. To all of today's speakers and performers, I thank you. And Mike Schill, special thanks for your two generous words today and for your friendship and mentorship. Working as your vice dean at UCLA set me on the path that brought me here today. And you are a wonderful friend, and I am incredibly lucky that you are now just a couple hours down the road. My family, thank you does not begin to convey how much you mean to me. My parents, Dale and Bob Manukin, thank you for instilling in me the belief that love and intellectual capital are the two most important currencies. To my younger but taller sister, Allison Manukin, thank you for knowing when to give advice and knowing when to listen. And thank you so much to the numerous members of my extended family here today as well. And my children, Sophia and Isaac Deanstag, watching you blossom into amazing young adults has been a blessing beyond belief. And Joshua Deanstag, my wonderful husband, thank you for your tremendous blend of brilliance and support. You are both a deep thinker and a great cook. <laughs> I am beyond lucky to have you as my partner on this academic leadership journey and in my life. Now that was a lot of thank yous, and at the same time, far too few. And let me be clear, I feel enormously grateful to be here. But this day and this celebration, they're really not about me. They're about us and a university grown from a deep-rooted commitment to making a genuine and positive difference across Wisconsin, across our whole country, and the globe. What the University of Wisconsin-Madison is and what it needs to be for the sake of our students, our state, and our society, those are the subjects we must address, not just today, but in the years ahead. So let me return for a moment to our friend, Professor Tom Brock. My own training in the social study of science has always led me to be curious about the similarities and analogies between the processes of science and the larger patterns of our social world. So as I read about Tom Brock and his research, I couldn't help but note the parallels between the ways in which TAC polymerase acts on DNA and the way in which our guiding principle of service to humankind, which we call the Wisconsin idea, acts on our university. Both amplify and accelerate both make something bigger and stronger than it was before. Both have a kind of multiplier effect, one microscopic, the other as big as the world. The Wisconsin idea is both anchor and propeller, keeping us grounded to our mission while creating that multiplier effect that allows us to do truly great things at scale. It must remain at the heart of our goals and aspirations for our beloved university. Now there's a story that many of you know well. Harry Steenbach was a UW professor who invented a process for adding vitamin D to milk, which virtually eliminated the common childhood disease called rickets. Steenbach had little desire for personal wealth, but a deep desire to make sure his invention could help people which meant keeping it out of the hands of charlatans, peddling phony, exaggerated claims, or setting prices that would put enriched milk well out of reach for most families. Indeed, before the patents were acquired, ads for bottled sunshine at exorbitant prices began popping up. But Steenbach faced enormous pushback from people who were offended by the idea that a professor here at UW should patent an invention and thereby spoil the beneficence of pure academic research with the sullied potential for money-making or profit. 
He needed a way to guarantee that the money flowing in would be invested back into the university. And so WORF, the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, the first of its kind in the nation, was born here. WORF was both controversial and groundbreaking, but 98 years after its founding, it has provided a cumulative total of more than $4.1 billion to seed research excellence and fuel the kind of discovery and innovation here that can change and better lives, making this campus number seven in the world for US patents and playing a role in helping us be a hugely powerful economic engine with an impact of more than $31 billion a year on this great state of Wisconsin. That, again, is the multiplier effect of the Wisconsin idea. Now, before I had the good fortune of becoming chancellor, I already knew about the Wisconsin idea. Given that I have spent basically my whole career at great public research universities committed in their own ways to the public good, I recognize that the Wisconsin idea named something so powerful about what a first-rate public university should be that the idea of the Wisconsin idea itself traveled far beyond the boundaries of this state. I also knew about it in a more personal way. As many of you have heard me say, in December 2020, in the depths of the pandemic, the University of Wisconsin solution made it possible for me to donate my kidney in Los Angeles and have it safely preserved as it traveled on a United Airlines red eye to Boston and to my father, who was suffering from late stage kidney disease. I'm so grateful that he is now healthy enough to be here today and in fact, to have led today's academic procession. <laughs> The greatness of our university and of our state are indisputably linked. The strength of one rises on the strength of the other. Back in 1904, at a jubilee celebration of UW's first graduates, Governor Robert La Follette, Fight and Bob, captured the dimensions of our strength while exhorting us to do even more. He said, it's not enough that this university shall zealously advance lear learning, or that it shall become a great storehouse of knowledge, or that it shall maintain the highest standards of scholarship and develop every talent. All these, he said, are vitally essential, but the state demands more. The state asks that you give back. We have, I think it's fair to say, made good on that promise. But what about tomorrow? How can we make sure that our 175-year-old institution will shine even more brightly on its 200th birthday? That our impact will not just be multiplied and amplified, but strengthened exponentially? What obstacles must we remove and what seeds must we plant to grow a university that accomplishes these goals and also stays open it stays open to the mysteries and surprises that will inevitably come along and shuffle the deck so we can see and embrace both the magnificent views and the transformative yellow slime. How will we respond to these questions? How we respond will determine our ability to accelerate our impact and assure our ongoing intellectual leadership as one of the world's greatest universities. The needs are substantial. We face ongoing threats to public health, global political instability, racial justice issues, pervasive mental health challenges, growing income inequality, technical advances like AI that raise complicated ethical and moral questions, the perils of social media and disinformation, and of course, climate change. 
not to mention the substantial political polarization in this country that makes progress on any of these critical and challenging issues a good deal harder still, as it too often seems like people distrust each other before they even stop to listen to each other. Speaking of distrust, we have another wrinkle. As Mike Schill also noted, in a nation that long viewed public universities as a public good and college degrees as a clear positive, we now see a significant share of people not only turning away from these ideals, but questioning some of the bedrock values on which we've built this system of higher education that is the envy of the world. And let me say, many of the questions people are asking about us are legitimate questions to ask. Does college cost too much? Are we adequately preparing students for the workforce as well as for the challenges that they will face in their years ahead? Even if we may think that the criticisms are exaggerated or misplaced, we need to listen, we need to recognize them and answer them better than we have in the past. We need to make sure we are affordable, especially for Wisconsin families. We need to make sure we are a place where all students can flourish, no matter their backgrounds, their identities, or their political perspectives. We need to make sure, in the words of Bob LaFollette, that we are not just a great storehouse of knowledge, but that we impart that knowledge in a way that engages our students deeply in their learning, connects with them as humans, and that the degrees that we confer reflect not only the successful completion of coursework, but a real ability to add something of value to the world. And we need to strengthen and affirm our efforts to acknowledge that the land under our feet is the ancestral homeland of the Ho-Chunk people, and to build strong relationships with the native nations who call Wisconsin home. Now, we do not have to have precisely the same answers about how to create the conditions that will best allow us to address the many issues that our world is facing. Indeed, we shouldn't all have precisely the same answers. But we can, I think, find common ground in, when what, in what one Illinois politician running for president back in 1952 said in a campaign speech here in Madison that still rings true. The Wisconsin tradition, he said, means a faith in the application of intelligence and reason to the problems of society. I think that's right. Intelligence and reason and applying that to the problems of society is absolutely critical. It's also insufficient. Those goals and values are pieces of a puzzle, parts of a whole. Other pieces come in a variety of shapes and colors, and they include curiosity, compassion, courage to cross boundaries and work in ways that are radically interdisciplinary, commitment to being a place where ideas are nurtured and explored, and to being a community where all people have a strong enough sense of belonging that they can also engage successfully across differences. This is a tall order, but if we can manage to put these pieces together, we will multiply our ability to address momentous challenges here in Wisconsin and around the world. I have great confidence that we can do this and that we will succeed. I have already seen the strength of our shared commitment to impact, to excellence, and to collaboration. In just the few months since I've arrived, we've celebrated an important new financial aid program, Bucky's Pell Pathway, to help ensure that our, all of our talented Wisconsin students, regardless of their family's income, can afford not only to come here, but to have a full Wisconsin experience. Thank you. Chancellor Wiley is right that there's challenges ahead for athletics, but we've also brought in exciting new coaches in football and hockey. Our women's hockey team won its seventh national title to become the winningest team in history. 
And we here at UW-Madison have showed more fan support for women's sports this last year than any other school in the country. I think that's awesome. We've also launched a permanent center for campus history, the Rebecca M. Blank Center, born out of the important work of the Public History Project to making looking backward, thoughtfully and unflinchingly, part of how we move forward. Thank you. Starting today, we don't want to give up the Wisconsin modest, but let's celebrate our UW-Madison impact a little more loudly than has sometimes been our want. Let's celebrate this university where engineers work with fashion designers, where economists work with scientists creating new biofuels from poplar trees, where practicing artists like the incredible Linda Berry, one of our several MacArthur Genius Award winners, inspire students in the STEM fields to solve problems by making art, a wonderful approach to igniting curiosity. Let's celebrate the university that's engineering ordinary T cells to be like heat-seeking missiles that can find and destroy cancer cells. Let's celebrate this university where industry, the government, and research have come together so that the Center for Dairy Research can serve as the doctor on call to Wisconsin's impressive dairy industry. Let's celebrate the university that created the discussion project that has trained hundreds of teachers in fields from chemistry to political science to create more engaging classroom discussions while shedding new light on how high quality classroom discussions can impact our students' learning and sense of belonging. Let's celebrate that we are graduating more undergraduate students than ever, with more than 60% of them graduating with zero debt, with an average time to graduation of just 3.8 years, and that applications to our great university are at an all-time high. All right, worth celebrating. So yes, Let's celebrate all of this and so much more, but let's also never be self-satisfied. The needs are great, and we must commit to growing our ambitions in the years ahead, to doing still more to multiply and to amplify our commitments to education, to research, and to service, to meet our challenges head on, hand in hand, with strong and motivated partners not for ourselves, but for the people we serve and for the good of Wisconsin, the nation, and the globe. Now, what will that mean? It will mean growing our faculty with a special focus on strategic and cross-disciplinary hiring in places where we can move from good to great and from great to extraordinary. It will mean further amplifying the impressive $1.3 billion of funded research we do each year. It will mean building deeper partnerships with both industry and with communities all across the state. It will mean bringing creativity and bold ideas to the critical task of defining a liberal arts education for the 21st century and beyond. It will mean a renewed focus on helping our students, staff, and faculty to ensure their flourishing. And it will mean redoubling our efforts to create a campus where every student, whether first in their family to go to college or a fourth generation badger, whatever their race, sexual orientation, or gender identity, whatever their political viewpoint, Whatever their religion, whether they hail from a big city or a small rural community, that every student knows that they belong and that they are an integral part of the kaleidoscopic fabric that makes us great. Let us also work to become a national model for how universities can engage across difference. Because this is a problem that we cannot ignore 
To be sure, it's not a Wisconsin problem or even a university problem. It's a problem for our whole nation and for democracy. We've seen too, far too many examples of people on both the right and the left wanting to silence or censor speech and ideas they disagree with. Here at UW-Madison, we need to remain resolutely committed to that continual and fearless sifting and winnowing by which alone truth can be found. At the same time, we need to acknowledge that not all of our students have the same sense of full belonging here or equally feel that this special place, our university, is, so to speak, for them. And not everyone at UW-Madison feels consistently comfortable sharing their views, whether in the classrooms or in the hallways. Our university must be a place that not only welcomes all points of view and allows for free discussion of ideas, but that also simultaneously helps students develop a strong sense of belonging so they can flourish and so that they can learn to talk across difference without feeling untethered or unmoored. And so I say to you, free speech and belonging must both be core institutional priorities. They must both be North Stars that guide our way. To be sure, they are sometimes in tension with one another, but both must be non-negotiable. It's urgent that we help build pathways back to civil dialogue across difference. And I firmly believe that this university can be a national leader in supporting both free speech and belonging by creating the place that the author, activist, and UW alum, Bell Hooks, envisioned when she said, I want there to be a place in the world where people can engage in one another's differences in a way that is redemptive, full of hope, and possibility. Let us here at UW-Madison lead the way. Let our future story be dazzling and bright. Let us connect with curiosity and enthusiasm across our differences and across our disciplines. Let us grow our partnerships and our collaborations to do more and greater things together than we could ever do alone. calling for will make us stronger in the years ahead, but it won't be easy. Some might even call it impossible, given the challenges of our times, but that cannot and will not deter us. The renowned historian Bill Cronin retired from UW almost exactly one year ago. I read and admired his books back when I was a graduate student. In his final lecture here, he said this, there are many things we did together that were impossible. They couldn't be done. But we didn't know they couldn't be done. And so we figured out a way to do them. And that's the way the world works. That's my job as your chancellor, to figure out how to do impossible things. And it's your job, too. Let us bring the same passion and curiosity to the tasks before us that Tom Brock brought to uncovering life in the unlikeliest of places. Fulfilling our common purpose to do the impossible together for the sake of our state, our country, our students, our people, and our future is a solemn mission. It is also a most joyful opportunity. Thank you so much, and on Wisconsin. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so, so, so much. Now, please help me.
me welcome some very talented students to the stage, the Mad Hatters. Uh, and if you're able, please stand as you're able and join us in singing Varsity. <laughs> Thank you. 